morning, everyone. Um, so glad to be here with you guys this morning. Um, have the blessing of bringing God's word to everyone. We're going to be spending some time in the book of Acts. So um, if everyone has their Bibles, if we could go to Acts chapter 16. And we'll be reading from verse 25 to verse 34. That is Acts chapter 16 from verse 25 to verse 34. I'm going to read it and then pray and then I'll get started. I'll give everyone a second to get there. Acts chapter 16, verse 25 to 34. And this is what the word of the Lord says. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately... All the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for, the, called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds and was baptized at once he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessing of your word this morning. I pray for your help as I preach your word, Lord. Father, be with us. May we be alert and attentive to what you have to say in your word, Lord. Father, may we grow um, in truth and in good works, Lord God, as we hear from you, Lord. Father, I pray for anyone who does not know you, that as your word is spoken, Lord God, they will draw to you. They will see their need for the Saviour, Jesus, and they will come to repentance and faith in the only one who is mighty to save. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 So this portion of Scripture... Um, is what we would call narrative, right? So we see, we're looking at the missionary journey of Paul. Just to set the scene on what's currently going on at this moment of time, we see the Apostle Paul, who's accompanied by Silas, Timothy, and at this point also Luke. And as they're going about their missionary journey, they've now come into a new continent. They've come to the city of Philippi. Philippi at this point is under Roman occupation. Some of what happens while they're there. Well, first of all, we see that they gather with a group of women who are by the riverside and they were meeting together in prayer. And the Bible tells us about this woman. Her name is Lydia. Now, later on, we're told more about Lydia, that um, she is somebody who worshipped the Lord and that the Lord opened her eyes and she was attentive to the word of the Lord. We see after she is then baptised, and a theme that we tend to see quite a lot of in the book of Acts, we see it in other places in the book of Acts, is that her household was also saved and they also came to salvation. So that's some of what's going on. And Paul and Silas, as they continue their journey, they come to a point where they are now in a place where they're on their way to prayer. And they are, um, there is this demon-possessed woman who comes up to them. And then begins to say that she knows who they are. She speaks of them and she, she declares that they are the one who serve the most high God. And it's distracting to Paul and Silas. And in that moment, we, say, we see Paul cast out the demon out of her. Interesting, this obviously caused an uproar 
as this woman's demon possession was making a lot of money for her owners. Side note, it's interesting to see how the bondage of some works to the profit of others. But that's a side note. So then at this point, Paul has cast the demon out of this woman. Causing an uproar, we see the magistrates and the people seize Paul and Silas. Seizing Paul and Silas, we see that they are beaten with rods. Now, if you know anything about Jewish history, you would know that there was a restriction on the number of times somebody could be beaten with rods. There was a limit of 40 beatings or stripes that they could be given. Sometimes you'd see people restrict that to 39 so that they would avoid going past that 40 point because they knew that was a limit. So that was Jewish custom, that was Jewish law. But here we see Philippi is under Roman occupation. So there is no such limit. So there actually isn't a limit to the amount of time they can be beaten. We're not told the number of times, but it could have actually exceeded that amount. A bit of a trigger warning. If we look into the type of things that were going on with Paul and Silas, first of all, let's acknowledge the type of beatings that they would have received at this point. These weren't lashes that could just rip the skin, but these were lashes that, were, that could break um, that could break a rib in, a, in somebody's body and chip away at the bones. And as a result of that, it could leave horrible welts. So we know at this point, Paul and Silas are injured. To, add, um, to make matters worse, they are then kicked and put into prison. And in this prison, the scripture tells us about how their feet is fastened, right? And it's fastened in stocks. And we know that in these stocks, they can be adjusted, and they could be put in a position where their feet is so uncomfortable to add to further injury. Again, we're speaking about two men who are going through immense types of torturous and horrible actions against them. Men who are doing good, but as a result, they receive suffering. And that's how we're led here to verse 25. Let's read what verse 25 says. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. So in what some would call a crisis of faith, we see that is a cause for Paul and Silas to worship God. We see in that moment they are singing to God. They are praying. I mean, some people would be praying in that instance, even if we look at the Psalms, we look at what David was saying about some of his enemies, right? Some of the people were coming against him. So we can appreciate in those moments you'll be praying. What you'll be praying would be very subjective on the person, depending on how you're feeling at the time. But we know there'll be a form of prayer. But they don't just limit it to prayer. They're actually singing hymns to God. They are singing praise to their God in this situation. And it leads us to question, how much suffering can we endure before we ruin our witness to Christ? Can we continue in the midst of suffering without compromising our worship to our God? Can we continue even in the midst of those moments? Will we proclaim and not defame the name of our God in the midst of suffering? As that's often called into question, particularly in our culture and what we see, sometimes it doesn't take very much for people to turn from God or despise God. But that was not the case for Paul and Silas. In this situation, where they were going through a tumultuous time, a time of, of adversity, we saw that they continued to give praise unto God. They were not angry at God. Instead of cursing God, they blessed God in that situation. Let us be reminded that in the midst of our suffering, that there are many who have come before us and they have blessed God and they have glorified God in the midst of that. We're then told, just, before, just at the end of that verse, it says the prisoners were listening to them. So there was others around who could observe the worship and the praise of Paul and Silas. Is it not the same now? Sometimes we look at our suffering and what we may go through, and it's internalized. We see ourselves, but we don't observe what other people see. What people see our consistent worship to God in the midst of our suffering. Will we have a demeanor of praise, or will we be sour in the midst of hardship? So we know that our attitude in the midst of suffering is important. I can only imagine 
the sound of the worship of Paul and Silas in this moment. The, the authenticity and the beauty of their worship as they saw, as they were going and enduring such, such suffering in this moment. And some may say they did it despite of their suffering. So they, they were going through this and they said, yes, we will push forward and worship God. But we can also observe that they probably did it because of their suffering. In the moment where they were going through so much, they knew that they had to draw closer to God. There was a dependency on God. Who knows what they were thinking in that moment? Maybe they were thinking, ah, oh, suffering is temporary, you know? Maybe the, the goodness of God was clearer to them in that moment in the midst of suffering. What we do know, regardless of the questions that we may ask, we do know that God was sustaining them with joy in the midst of suffering. And we see what happens in verse 26. It reads, And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. So we see Paul and Silas singing, and after their singing, we see a massive earthquake, right? Which shakes the foundations of the prison. The timing of the earthquake we see is a supernatural act of God. God intervenes and opens the prison doors on behalf of Paul and Silas. Two observations I wanted to highlight from this, this verse alone. One of the things, and I think it's clear, we see the miracle of God. God sees his people suffering and he brings about a miracle for them. God sees the, the praise and the worship and the, the, the need that Paul and Silas have in this moment and he intervenes. But maybe the purpose of God bringing about this miracle is more than we probably see initially, right? There could be a deeper reason this miracle came about. And I'll tell you why I think that. A few verses later in this chapter, we will see that the magistrates will return to the prison doors, right? To the prison, and they will release Paul and Silas on their own initiative. So at this point, Paul and Silas, this miracle has happened, the earthquake has happened, and um, as we're going to read, um, we see the conversion of the jailer. They go to the jailer's house. So obviously after that point, they come back to the prison, and I'm assuming they, they clamp their chains back together. And the next day we see the magistrate come, and then release Paul and Silas and said, leave. So we know that God in his providence knew that this would happen. God in his foreknowledge knew that this would happen. So why didn't God just wait until the magistrates return? Maybe the miracle wasn't just for Paul and Silas. Maybe this miracle was for the salvation of this jailer. So that's, that's one observation. The other observation brings us back to this question of suffering, right? A question that we will continue to ask um, until the end of time, until Jesus returns, right? The question of suffering in this situation or in the situation before, if God can stop suffering, why doesn't he? These, this is clearly God's servants. These are people serving God. So in earlier stages, why did God not stop suffering? I don't think in this passage we have all that answered. But I think what we can see about God and the question of suffering in this scripture is that we know that God can intervene to stop suffering, which he does, right? He does. We see the earthquake and, and, and their chains are released. That's one thing. We also see that God does not always intervene to stop suffering. I mean, obviously, at the point in which they were enduring their beating, God didn't intervene necessarily at that stage. So we know that sometimes God doesn't intervene. And one final thing, God does intervene to stop suffering sometimes. So God could have stopped their suffering back when they were arrested by the magistrates, but he decided not to, and he chose to do it at this point. So God, according to his will, decides when he does intervene in the midst of suffering. And that brings us to verse 27. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was in this situation and I was in a prison and God came through an earthquake, set me free, one of the first things I would do, first of all, I thank God, that he set me free from these prison chains. I'd pick up my stuff, 
and be so quick to leave that prison. <laughs> I would, yeah, it's true. I don't have anything. It's true. I saw it even quicker. Like, no, nothing to look back to. Just go. I would have probably looked around at Silas if I was Paul and said, listen, our mission here is done. We need to go to the next city. So that's something that would come to mind. But that's not quite what we see in Paul and Silas's response, do we? In verse 27, we see that the keeper is about to um, kill himself, right? So obviously at the point when he's about um, to kill himself, we'll later see that Paul and Silas intervene in this situation and tell him not to. So we see that Paul and Silas in this moment, even though there was an open door, they weren't necessarily quick to take it. They weren't quick to think, okay, this is an opportunity for us to leave. But they saw God in his wisdom and in his discernment that he gave to Paul and Silas at the time, they saw that it was an opportunity to be a witness for God. And we think of this God who in this moment is about to kill himself. And may I say for good reason, right? So he's not, there's, there's these prisoners which were under his watch and he's just allowed, well, allowed, right? They've, they've been able to potentially escape. And he's probably be thinking at this point, you know, I might as well take my own life because it's going to be taken from me. If you know anything about the custom at the time, it was the guard's responsibility to keep the prisoners there. And at the point, the guard would have allowed any prisoners to leave. He would have been charged with the same crime that they would have had. So, for example, there would have been people who would have been under death row or would have been killed. So the guard would have potentially taken on that punishment. So he's probably thinking... I'm going to save them the job of killing me before they talk, after they torture me a lot. I'm going, to, I'm going to say, let me take my own life. So the guard would have had good reason to kill himself at this point. But God in his wisdom even saw this man, this guard, in this situation. And we see Paul and Silas step in. And that's what we see at this point. So even though it might have appeared that God had brought about a green light for them to escape, after all, it was God who brought about this earthquake. God in his wisdom orchestrated it so that they would be a comfort to the guard, so that they would draw the guard to them. Verse 28, this is where we see Paul um, intervene in this situation. But Paul cried with a loud voice, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. Paul is saying, drop the sword. Whatever you're going to do to yourself, you don't have to do it. Paul and Silas are quick to demonstrate that grace and that love and that care in that moment. In a critical moment, they come through and they reflect. They reflect the goodness of God in the the life of this man. What may have appeared as a blessing for Paul and Silas and what would have appeared as a curse for this jailer ultimately would have worked for the blessing of the jailer. They use it as an opportunity to be a witness for Christ. In those moments, they were able to draw to this man and help him. Help him see the goodness of God. Verse 29 and 30. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in. Trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, What must I do to be saved? So he was obviously so impressed with the love and the life and the joy that Paul and Silas were demonstrating in prison. Bear in mind that a few verses before, it's clear that at the point that they are in prison, they are observers, there's people watching. And at this point, this jailer now acknowledges his need His need for salvation. What does he say? He says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? He is trembling. Fear has entered his heart. He sees the the risk. He has a fear of death. He sees that what could happen potentially is his death. And in that moment, he cries out for help. We see his physical fear of death. We see that as an opportunity for the entrance of a spiritual hope for life. We see that there is a hope that he can now have, right? And let's just acknowledge acknowledge the providence of God in this situation. 
how God chose this event to bring man to salvation, to bring this man to salvation. I think of the various ways that God communicates to his people or communicates through the apostles in various ways in this scripture. So looking back at the story of Paul, for example, we think of the road to Damascus where he saw the Lord Jesus and the Lord was revealed to him. Or we see in the situation with Ananias when God speaks to Ananias concerning Paul. We see um, various prophecies or people speaking to Paul about the things that he would encounter. So we see the multidimensional ways that God communicates to his people. Um, even here, we can, lean, we can glean in and look at how God decides to speak to his people in this situation. In his providence, he allows the imprisonment of Paul and Silas and the earthquake to bring us to this very place where the gospel is preached to this man who sees his need for salvation. Verse 31. And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Let's just take a second to acknowledge the response of Paul and Silas in how salvation is obtained. Some may be quite critical of Paul and Silas's approach and say, doesn't the way that he, they provide seem too easy? Does it not provide easy grace? Which is far from the truth, which we see, it just highlights how we are to obtain salvation, how the Lord provides a way of salvation through the believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. They articulate it clearly. They say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't provide him with a list of things that he has to do, but highlights the simple gospel that our faith in Christ brings about salvation. We see the repentance in this man, in his attitude. He comes and there is a desperate need for salvation. So the repentance element, I, I would argue that we see it in him coming to them and saying, what must I do to be saved? Obviously, he's, he acknowledges his spiritual bankruptcy as he begins to ask about and inquire of how he is to be saved. And we see, the, uh, um, we see Paul respond, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Taking even a second to look at the word believe. I know in our culture, some may, may see it as an intellectual assent or some just acknowledging that Jesus at one time existed or was around. But if we take ourselves back to ancient Greek vocabulary, what would have been meant by believe would be a lot deeper than what we would consider it to be today. How we would look at the word believe would be to trust in or to rely on or to cling to or to attach ourselves onto something, onto somebody, right? Trusting and in a loving way, attach ourselves to somebody or something. So that word believe, how it would have been communicated to this guard or, how, um, to this guard or this jailer, how he would have received it. He would have understand, understood the spiritual implications of what it would have meant. An illustration, there was a Bishop John, his name was um, John Taylor Smith. He was an old chaplain general of the British Army. And he had a unique test for how he would go about allowing people or allowing um, people to come into his chaplaincy, right? What he would say is if somebody or somebody was interested in becoming part of his army and his chaplaincy, he would ask them, if somebody was injured at battle and they had three minutes to live, how would you articulate to them about how they are to be saved and receive peace with God? He would use this as a means for somebody to come into his chaplaincy. So if they were unable to answer that question, it would clearly indicate that they weren't fit to be in his chaplaincy. So even from this, we can acknowledge the importance of being able to articulate those who are seeking the gospel or seeking to hear about Christ, how important it is to be able to, to clearly speak about who Jesus is and how they can be saved. So I guess that brings a question to all of us. Can we do that? If we had a time restriction, if we were encountered with somebody who wanted to know about how they are to be saved, would we be able to articulate it? Would we know how to share in a short, period, in a short time period with a few sentences, how they can come to, to know the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's clear that Paul and Silas at this point articulate to him, speak to him and say, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household, right? So he clearly articulates that. And then verse 32, if we look there, 
it says, And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to, who, to all who were in his house. So, so we saw that not just the jailer, but his entire household had trusted in the word of the Lord after it had been spoken to him. So to avoid any confusion, because some people may look at verse 31 and say, because, through this jailer believing in the Lord Jesus, he will be saved and his household will be saved, almost as a transfer of his salvation. Well, I would say verse 32 kind of removes that, right? Because we see that um, the word of the Lord was spoken to his whole household. So we can acknowledge that salvation came from them, the, the word of God being spoken to them, them hearing the word of God, them believing the word of God, and that bringing about salvation. So that, that I guess, I just wanted to highlight that, just to highlight how salvation is individual. So there was no transfer of salvation from the jailer to his household, but rather they all heard and they then believed. So the power of the, we see the power of the living word. So at this point, we see Paul and Silas as they are in prison. We saw their witness as they were, as they were filled with joy, as they re retained their um, testimony of Christ in how they behaved and conducted themselves. And now the, the Lord has opened the door for where they can communicate the truth of the gospel. So we see their lives and how they live, and also we see them as they speak. So, how, one thing I wanted to highlight, so as well as their lifestyle and their words reflecting Christ, we see that the, this whole entire family comes to salvation. I want us to acknowledge, I think I'm, I raised before the, the um, story of Lydia and how with Lydia, we see also her household. We see her household is baptized. So we see God in his grace and his goodness bring about salvation to multiple people within a family or a household. I know that when I was first saved, that was something that was heavy on my heart. A desire to see other members of my family also saved and come to know God. And I thank the Lord for bringing stories like this and keeping stories like this in scripture where we see him in his grace bring not just one person in a household to salvation, but multiple people. So we, are, we know we serve a God who is able to save households, amen? amen? He's able to save multiple people in one household. And then what do we see in verse 34 and 34, um, 33 and 34? I'm going to read it. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. The man who a few hours ago was whipping and torturing Paul and Silas. He was ensuring that they remained in stocks and remained in chains and supervising their um, incarceration. Now, all of a sudden, in the space of a short time, he is now entertaining Paul with his family. We see the immediate effects of the salvation of God and how, in a short period, God is able to change the heart of somebody from having a disposition in a certain way and now changing their direction into another way. And we see how their lifestyle begins to reflect that. I love how this scripture mentions the word rejoice. There was a rejoicing that now happened now that this man is saved. This man who was trembling, crying out to Paul and Silas how he is to be saved. He received his answer. He received his way of salvation. And now, as he has received his way of salvation, we see he rejoices. We see joy fill their household. We see God in the midst of all of it. I think sometimes in the midst of suffering, we have a tendency to be quite short-sighted. I think suffering has a way of making you think internally and just see things in that context. But one beautiful thing about this, first of all, Paul and Silas could have never imagined that this would be the outcome of what they would have endured. Now, look at what the Lord has done. Not just has, this, has he brought the salvation of this jailer, 
Salvation has extended to his entire family. Who knows the traje- how the trajectory of not just that household, but future family members who would have come, how that trajectory would have changed as a result of the witness of Paul and Silas, as a result of their obedience, as a result of them following the Lord and enduring in the midst of suffering. We talk about households and families. Who knows how this would have changed the trajectory of nations, the trajectory of generations, how God was able to work through the obedience of his people in the midst of deep suffering, how he was able to change outcomes for generations and nations and households. That's something that we can definitely take away from this story. That is something that we can definitely glean and begin to look at our God and see the marvelous ways that he works, the hope that he provides, the fear that he releases, because this man was in a place of fear, but now he's in a place of rejoicing. It's definitely something we are to look to and to glorify our God in. Let us be reminded of the God who is able to do wonders through suffering. And let us glean from this narrative and this story of Paul and Silas of how God is able to save beyond what we can imagine. In summary, I want us to just see this story and look to this. Maybe a lot of us would have read this story before and would have definitely taken a lot from it. Maybe this introduces a different way of thinking about this story or a deeper way of thinking about this story. We see the suffering of God's people and we see the beauty that comes as a result of it. So one thing we can definitely learn is Paul and Silas remind us of the endurance of God's people through suffering. And we are also reminded of the amazing power of God to save. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for um, how your word is a witness to the reality of life. How, Lord God, um, we don't just look at the saints that we have around us, Lord God, to, to encourage us when it comes to suffering and hard times. We, we look to scripture and we look at the saints who came before us and we see how you did amazing things through them. So, Lord God, to those who may um, need encouragement in this moment through suffering, through pains of life or through obedience that might not feel the best, Lord God, I pray, Lord God, that you will strengthen them through this scripture. You will, you will strengthen them through this word, Lord God, to press on and trust, in, trust that you know what you are doing through the midst of it all. Heavenly Father, I pray for anyone who does not know you. And may they be able to look at the mir- miraculous working of God through this scripture. May they see how a jailer like this, a man who did not know God, how through the preaching of the gospel of God, through him believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, he was saved. Father, help us to remember your truth. May we store it in our hearts, Lord God. Help us in all things. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Amen.